In September 2014, when My Life in Gaming was just under one year old, we released RGB 102 to show how we integrate high quality video from retro consoles into modern gaming setups. But the thing is, so much has changed since then. We decided it was time for a new look behind the scenes. Sure, maybe gaming setup tours are a bit cliche, but with good reason. They're just fun. And this is how we pull it all together to make my life in gaming. If you remember all the way back to RGB 102, you may recall how I managed to create a pretty decent setup in a fairly tiny space. Shortly after the release of that episode, my wife and I found a house that we really loved and we ended up buying it and moving. So I scrapped everything that I had before and utilized what I learned over the years to create a setup that could possibly last forever. Going in, I knew that I wanted to create an optimized space where I could do three specific things play games, edit video, and produce my life in gaming. I've got to say, I think I've managed to do all those things while being as thrifty as possible. A huge chunk of what I've done with this space is because of frequent stops in my local Goodwill and other thrift shops. So let's put on some tunes and take a look at what I've put together. Here we are. You know, there was a point where I thought I'd kind of gone a little bit too far with all this. Kind of felt a little embarrassed about it. But needless to say, I got over it pretty quick. Now, I have three different areas to show you. But let's talk about the most obvious one first. My main gaming setup. I've got 20 consoles hooked up on these wire racks here. Two, zero, 20. You might wonder why I have a couple of the systems hooked up that I don't quite need. Like, why would I have a PS1 when I have a PS2 hooked up? Well, if you've been following my life in gaming for a while, you know that we love to compare and contrast different pieces of hardware. That's the simple answer. To the side, I have an older Windows PC. This was my editing system when the channel first started. These days, I use it to play some lighter Steam games, like Ease or Trails in the Sky because it only has a lowly NVIDIA GTX 260 in it. Hidden away down here is my super gun. If you're unfamiliar with what a super gun is, well, the short answer is that it's basically consoleized arcade hardware. I can plug arcade PCBs into it using a JAMA extension cable. And then I'm playing real arcade games in my home. This would have blown my mind as a kid. To manage all of these as efficiently as possible, I've connected all of these with a variety of SCART, HDMI, and component switch boxes. SCART switches are by Bandridge and G-SCART. The HDMI boxes are by Monoprice and Kinevo. And component is by Impact. You know, every time anyone asks me about different switchers, I tell them that it's pretty important to make sure that they're powered. This helps you avoid image degradation. All of my switchers, except those Bandridge SCART switchers, have their own power supply. Over here, I have all of my extra AV equipment. Necessities like an audio receiver so I can take advantage of 5.1 surround sound, a Blu-ray player for, obviously, watching movies. You know, I actually prefer to use a standalone player instead of a newer console because it cuts down on wear and tear in the long run. Finally, I have a DVD recorder and a good old-fashioned VCR hooked up. These items have been integral to making the old How to Beat videos. All of these switch boxes are connected to, you guessed it, my XRGB Mini FrameMeister, which cranks everything out to this 40-inch Samsung LED TV. 
I've even mounted it to the wall for maximum viewing angles. You know, I've actually gotten quite a few questions and comments about these wire racks that I set my systems on. Well, I purchased them from Target. So if you've got one nearby, I would assume they probably still have some. They're a perfect size to fit two or three consoles on each of the adjustable shelves. And the basic style of them seems great for heat dispersal, right? At least that's what I thought. I've also used a whole bunch of Velcro ties to make wires as invisible as possible. A total hassle to set up, but very much worth it. The systems don't even look like they're hooked up. For good measure, the entertainment stand is from Ikea. But I got it off of Craigslist back when I lived in Brooklyn. So I have no idea if they even make these anymore. I definitely can't forget this little guy over here, a Sony PVM-14M4U. This 13-inch 800-line PVM is pretty good, but I honestly don't play on it much. I mainly have this connected to quickly check out games and, most importantly, shoot video off of. Wait, shooting video off of? You may have noticed, but we feel that off-screen CRT and PVM footage is a very large part of the intended look of our show. Due to a CRT's refresh, it can be kind of challenging to get this footage. If you point a video camera at a CRT television, you might notice a line of varying thickness slowly moving down the screen. The key to avoiding this is to try to sync up the shutter on your camera to as close to the TV's 60Hz refresh as possible. Alas, I sit here on this comfy couch when I'm playing games over here. Well, comfy might be overselling it just a little bit but it is an improvement from what I had. I have an end table over here that conveniently hides away all of my peripherals and extra controllers. Everything is pretty much within reach, but while this is my main setup, it's not the only place I have to enjoy games. I've got quite a bit more going on behind me, so let's check it out. And now that is a lot of screens. But before I break it all down, yes, I have a recliner as my computer chair. All right, moving on. These two center screens are connected to my main PC. I'm a video editor by trade, and I do all of my editing in Adobe Premiere. I do like as much screen real estate as possible, so these two monitors are exclusively for my PC. However, I do duplicate my primary screen on my 40-inch Samsung. You know, for games and stuff. I'd consider my PC to be pretty good even though it's a couple of years old at this point. I'm running Windows 10 and I have an i7 processor under the hood, 32 gigs of RAM, and a GTX 970 as my main GPU. For audio playback, I've got these Mackie CR3 reference monitor speakers, which gives me clean, uncolored audio. But when I'm working, I mainly use these Sony MDR V6 monitoring headphones. I almost always edit with headphones on. I do all of my main capturing with an Abermedia Extreme Cap U3. I feed my capture card via a split HDMI line from my Framemeister. It's quick to set up and get going. Like I've said before, I can start capturing from whatever source I'm playing on with around 30 seconds of prep time. To the right, mounted to the wall, is this 23-inch LG HD TV that serves a number of purposes. One is that it's connected as a third monitor for my PC. Secondly, it can be an external viewing monitor for Adobe Premiere. A professional video editor should try to have an external monitor so you can see how material looks and plays on a real TV. Third, it's another output for my Framemeister. That's right, I split the signal yet again so I can play my games on this TV here. On the other side is my prized Sony PVM-20L5, courtesy of my friend Ricky. This PVM has multiple inputs, but I mainly use two one for component and one for RGB. Since I put this in place, I've done more and more of my retro gaming over here, with the Framemeister serving as simply a capture device. So wait a second, how am I sending the signal to both the Framemeister and all the way over here at the same time? That is a good question. Basically, both the G-SCART and the component switcher I have both have secondary video outputs so I can send video to two displays at once. So one of those outputs runs to the Framemeister, while the other one goes all along the wall and into the PVM. Of course, the RGB line hits that little PVM over there first and then feeds into the second PVM. 
which continues the chain and feeds this larger 27-inch Toshiba CRT. Now, I really only use this monster for light gun games. I can get a decent distance between me and the screen that way. Rounding out my work area is this dry erase board. I got the idea for doing this from my good friend Game Dave. I can quickly jot down episode ideas and other info here. Anyways, let's see just how ridiculous I can make all of this. Another thing that this whole setup is good for is live streaming. Have you watched our Sunday night live stream? If not, you really should. But if you have, well, this is where I do it. I'm able to play games on whichever TV I want. I face this way for HD games, and that way for SD games. And to top it off, in what was sort of a unplanned happy accident, I got a swivel arm for my microphone, which can move into place just perfectly based on the TV that I'm playing on for that week's stream. All of my audio for the live stream runs through an audio mixer. This enables me to have better control over how each person sounds and works great for having guests on with us. So, that pretty much does it. Ah, uh, just kidding. We've still got quite a bit to go. I've got all these consoles, but where the heck do I put all my games? Let's take a look what's behind this door. I am still amazed at how well this little area came together. I keep all of my games on these shelves. I do wonder if and when I'll run out of space, but I'll have to tackle that when the time comes. So would I consider myself a collector? I suppose, but I prefer to think of myself as having a curated collection. I only buy games that I intend on playing, or if I know it's something I'm going to like. Sure, I have a handful of games that fall outside of that rule. But you'll never see me just getting things that I have no interest in ever playing or having no use for. Whether or not I'll be able to play everything in the long run, well, I'm not getting any younger. Lots of games have come and gone from this collection, but I've been very fortunate that I've held on to a lot of my original release date copies of several games that tend to go for higher prices these days. I have a lot of sentimental feelings towards many of them, so if I was ever to let them go, it'd never be the same just rebuying them. The nostalgia I have is towards that specific copy of the game. My copy. This is what I like to call my My Life in Gaming set. It's been evolving over time, but I think I'm finally happy with it. I relocated this large desk from my mom's house when she sold it, and it works perfectly here. If you ever see a shot of something like laying on a table or a desk in our show, there's a good chance that this is where I shot it. It's also the main set for my section of the Tips and Tweaks series. I have a display of several systems, a 20-inch CRT that was given to me by my friend Chris, and of course these Fantasy Star bead sprites made for me by my friend Mike. All these systems are fully functional and playable, so I can load up stuff on screen if I ever want to. Also I have this piece of crap ViewSonic HDTV over here that I can run stuff to if I really want to show how awful some HDTVs do with 240p content. Now you might notice a bit of video equipment laying around here. Not only is this space great to put all that stuff, but I've set up the room for a complete transformation. Watch this. This is where I do my on-camera hosting for the show. Well, most of the time. Check it out, that HD TV on the wall back there I can even pull that out and use it as monitoring for when I'm on camera to make sure that I'm in focus. I set this all up so I can be as self-sufficient as possible, since, well, I do this all on my own. I put an overhead shop light as my main lighting source in here, but when shooting, I also use these soft box lights. You should always try to match the color temperature of your lighting. For instance, I'm using daylight 5500K bulbs in here. 
The blankets on the shelves and along the back of the room help deaden the sound in here and prevent my voice from ricocheting around. You may have also seen these little black squares all over the walls and ceilings throughout this entire video. These serve the same purpose and improve the acoustics in each room. Also, with some help, I've built these larger acoustic panels using rock wool insulation and wooden frames. I've then mounted them to the walls and ceilings. A question that some might have is, why use a green screen? Mainly, I chose the green screen approach because of the sound dampening that I do. It's also way easier for me to set up and shoot while getting a consistent look every time. Plus, it allows me a bit more freedom when it comes to the format of the show. I don't know. I do have to laugh when I think about how I'm actually green screening myself into a spot that's just a couple of feet away. But without the soundproofing that I do, this is what that spot ends up looking like. The whole setup actually works great for me though. I have no hair, so the keying is easy. Though, if I had to pick a downside to this setup, it's that it gets damn hot in here during the summer. Finally, if you're curious what kind of equipment I'm using to make my episodes of the show, right now I'm shooting on a Canon 70D DSLR camera and record all my audio using a Zoom H4n portable audio recorder. Since I'm especially bad at ad-libbing, our entire show is scripted and teleprompted. I use a split beam glass teleprompter which allows me to use my iPad for the text. It's pretty handy and it made being on camera a lot less stressful for me. All these devices have quick release plates on them so I can move them to whatever location I need. For instance, I created this tiny little sound booth for voiceover recording, which I am using this very second. So as you can see, there is a ton of stuff going on here. I have no idea how I figured it all out and made it work, but it does and it's very efficient at this point. Who knows what the future holds for my setup here, but I feel as of right now, I can't really improve it at all. At least until tomorrow when I think up something else. I swear, I fiddle with this stuff more than actually playing games sometimes. Rolling? Audio okay? A lot of people are surprised to learn that Corey and I live about eight hours apart. So while we help each other get B-roll and extra game footage all the time, the majority of each episode is shot and edited by either just Corey or just me. So both of our setups have to be fully self-sufficient. Corey is in a completely different house from when we did RGB 102, while my setup hasn't changed that much on the surface, but there have been some pretty neat upgrades behind the scenes. Let's start with an overview. I have the most history with Nintendo and Sony, so they're up front and center in chronological order. One of my favorite simple ideas I had for this section was to just tape a black cloth behind the unit to hide the wires from view. Sega consoles are over on the right side along with my handheld charging station and PSP Go back there, which I use as a micro console as I explained in RGB 206. The left side has my controller charging station along with the Retron 5 and PlayStation TV, and a handheld museum of sorts up top. Last year I had to add a new wing over by my PC for the Xbox consoles, and underneath this, Atari and ColecoVision are currently just for show, but I do have plans to get them refurbished and RGB ready. Other than those two, everything is connected and ready to play. Every single system is RGB component or HDMI. And before you ask, these main pieces are all just IKEA stuff. In these baskets, I recently started to keep my controllers in Ziploc bags of various sizes, which has turned out to be a very cost-effective way to keep them accessible and untangled. Oh, and on the opposite wall, game shelves. Kind of important. Running out of space, but hopefully I'll last a few more years without having to make drastic changes. The sections are all ordered by console release year. Handheld stuff recently moved onto its own unit, this tall tower is my game music collection, really short on space here. And this little shelf is where I've got game guides, Nintendo Power, and a few game tapes. But let's take a look at how it all comes together. At the center of everything is my 46-inch 1080p Samsung HDTV. 
At the time I bought it in 2012, it wasn't easy finding a matte finished screen like this anymore. I'll probably just have to accept that my next TV might be a little glossier than I'd prefer. Everything ultimately goes to this TV. I use it for modern games, retro games through the FrameMeister, and it's even my main video editing monitor. Seriously, wireless Logitech trackball and keyboard on my legs. I learned to use a keyboard on my lap playing the PS2 version of Final Fantasy XI and I figured, why not just always do that? Ditching the desk was the most liberating thing I ever did. Sometimes I even edit reclining. If you want to use a TV as a computer monitor, make sure you turn sharpness to the neutral setting so that every pixel is what it should be. Zero in my case. Artificial sharpness will really strain your eyes. Perhaps the most exciting addition to my setup since RGB 102 is my Sony PVM, model 14M2U. It's a 13-inch professional RGB monitor, and the picture is simply awesome. Sure, it's a little small to enjoy from my main seat, but that's what beanbag chairs are for. It's also handy for a second screen when friends are over. I would eventually like to upgrade to a 19-inch with 480p capability, but I'm really enjoying it for now. It's great for light gun games and, of course, getting shots off screen for the show. When we started My Life in Gaming, our RGB experience revolved entirely around the FrameMeister. We had no idea that people were using screens like this for retro gaming, but as we featured more and more stuff about retro console video quality, it became apparent that we both needed to dive into the CRT side of RGB. While Corey's setup allows him to enjoy his larger PVM as his primary retro gaming screen, I normally play looking at my HDTV through the FrameMeister. The FrameMeister really is the heart of my setup, essential for both gameplay and recording. Every single connected console, all 19, with maybe a little room to grow, ultimately ends up at the FrameMeister. Every HDMI device runs all the way around the room, under the table, across the floor, what are you going to do? Along with a bunch of other wires to and from this tiny control center of sorts with my secondary computer monitor next to my main seat here. This is a Monoprice 8 input HDMI switcher. Most inputs I could find and yep, they're all full. Haven't decided on a solution to that yet. The reason I have this set up next to my couch for manual switching is because Monoprice's HDMI switchers use the same infrared signal as the FrameMeister. Meaning that if I switch inputs with the remote, I'm probably also changing some unknown setting on the FrameMeister and yeah, that's bad. The HDMI switcher's output goes to a splitter that sends the signal to the TV and FrameMeister. I pass the HD systems through the FrameMeister just for the convenience of capture. It's set to not process HDMI inputs. This lets me consolidate all video signals, analog or digital, into a single HDMI output, which splits again to go back to the HDMI switcher, as well as my PC's capture card, the Avermedia Extreme Cap U3. Same one Corey uses. That's a few years old, but still pretty good. We actually just use the Rec Central software that comes with it, which lets us record MP4 files at up to 60 megabits per second. It supports 1080p at 60 frames, but it doesn't have an HDMI pass-through, which would be a problem if we weren't using the splitters. And no, splitting HDMI doesn't introduce any delay or quality issues. I also have this convenient little fiber optic audio switcher that I found on Amazon with four inputs and two outputs stuck to the top of my HDMI switcher because my audio receiver is too old to handle HDMI audio properly. Right now it's just the PS3, PS4, and SNES. Wait, SNES? Yep. Bob from RetroRGB.com talked me into adding a digital audio out to my RGB modded SNES Mini, and, you know, I'm no audiophile, but it is kind of neat pumping out pure digital SNES sound. This is my Skype mic, Samson Go mic. Everyone tells me it sounds really good and they can hear me from pretty far away. 
Corey and I use the same mixer for stream audio, and I use the Zoom H4n as my main mic for most everything, just like he does. What's different is that I've got this audio compressor to go along with it. I have a really wide vocal volume range, I guess? and very poor control over it. So this balances that and protects your ears from when I get overexcited on stream. All game audio does eventually end up at the TV via HDMI, including my PC and retro consoles through the FrameMeister. So I use my TV's digital out, a pretty standard feature, to push all of that into my sound system. And the analog out, another standard feature, to do a long run to the compressor's second channel which then goes to the mixer. This lets all game audio easily go to the stream without much extra balancing on my part. I get a lot of questions on stream about my headphones. They're Sennheiser HD 555. I've been using these for most of my years streaming on the Backloggery and here on Imlig, so there are newer models by now. I don't know if they're anything all that special, but they're open air headphones, which means people near you can probably hear it a bit, but you can also easily talk to other people and hear yourself without sounding muffled in your head. So I really recommend headphones like these for streaming purposes. Anyway, let's get back to how everything is hooked up. I use the same impact acoustics component switcher Corey has. GameCube, Wii, Xbox, and PSP all go into here and out to the FrameMeister via the component to D-terminal adapter. The switcher's second output goes to this box that Corey used to use to convert RGB to YPBPR component. Since my PVM doesn't have an extra set of inputs, I recently implemented this as a convenient way to get component systems to display on my PVM without swapping cables. The other end goes into this SCART switcher over here, so component systems can go into the PVM just as easily as RGB systems. Alright, so you probably aren't going to let both of us get away with just glossing over how RGB is connected, are you? One of the most common questions we get on the channel is, did you ever find a good SCART switcher? Well, Corey kind of let the cat out of the bag, but yes, we did. The automatic G-SCART that Corey briefly showed off is the real deal. We're going to go more in depth on the G-SCART and other switchers in a near future episode, but for now, I'll just say that, well, considering limited availability through Retro RGB, it's not easy to get your hands on, and it is pretty pricey, but if you somehow have a chance to get one for the number of inputs and quality, you will not be disappointed. The new G-SCART is a recent addition for both of us, but I've actually been using what I suppose could be considered a G-SCART prototype for over a year and a half now. Before the creator of the G-SCART had decided to perfect it and sell it through Retro RGB, I managed to get on a waiting list for a more limited run, and after getting over a bit of confusion with the sync and getting it set up at first, I was super happy with it. In addition to the converter box, I now have my PS2 and N64 on the older one, daisy chained to the newer one, with 9 RGB consoles currently being connected in all. In RGB 104, we showed how you can use PVM outputs to, say, pass the signal straight through to the FrameMeister. I was doing that for a while with no issues at all, but the new version of the G-SCART offers this VGA-style D-sub output which can carry an RGBS signal to your PVM, like with this cable from Monoprice that the creator of the G-SCART recommends. So now the SCART output just runs directly to the FrameMeister. Anyway, we'll get a lot more into this and other switching options some other time. This might look like I've got it all together, and for the most part, for normal use and the making of simple game-focused episodes, it really just works. But as the RGB masterclasses continue to become bigger and more involved, I'm always testing out different systems, using wires I don't normally use, and, well, it's always this big, huge mess. But I always aspire to clean it up to this state. So when I first moved here, it was about a year before the show started, and I honestly had no idea what I was going to do with the second floor. 
I mean, it's not like I've paid for space I didn't need because this was pretty much already the cheapest place I could buy. I put a guest room here, but it wasn't until my life in gaming started that I came up with a good use for this room. One of my oldest life goals was to have one room in my house fully decked out in retro style wood paneling. Well, two panels worth nailed directly to the wall might not quite fulfill the dream, but I still think it's one of the best things I ever did. Starting with the Mario 3 episode, this has become essential to the show's look. I shoot almost everything right here. I usually temporarily bring my consoles, games, accessories, and everything else upstairs to shoot stuff like plugging in cartridges and cables. But it doesn't exactly go as smoothly as it looks on the show. Oh, I actually got it. If I'm not up to the challenge, sometimes I'll just unplug the cable and reverse the footage. There's also all of those motorized turntable shots that I just can't resist using. I feel like they're kind of lazy, but I don't know. I think they're fun and an easy way to make something look neat. Now, sometimes people complain about our systems being gross and dirty or something, and I think that's a huge exaggeration, and it's not like we don't try. I always do a basic dusting and then keep this air blower on hand to get rid of any extra specks that I see land during a shot. A camera's lens can also make imperfections pop out in a way that your eyes might not see. Dust is just a sad fact of life. It's everywhere, and if we were too OCD about it, frankly, we'd never get anything done. For lighting, I just have two basic CFL studio lights with soft boxes. You can get a pair like this for well under 100 bucks on Amazon. Yeah, I know, it's not three-point lighting, but for now, it gets the job done. On the other side of my studio is the green screen. Now, this is just some soft, fuzzy stuff I got from Joanne Fabrics, and to be honest, I don't necessarily recommend it. With the fabric and mounting hardware, I was able to get a pretty cheap green screen solution, but I'm kind of jealous of what Corey has. Chroma keying is much easier if you're bald and don't wear glasses on camera. It's also easier if you can light the screen evenly and separately from your subject. I saw a video from YouTube DIY film guy Noptop that gave me the idea to use inexpensive LED shop lights for green screen lights. I've got them cable tied to these custom PVC pipe frames and I'm really happy with the difference all this made to the quality of my chroma key. I used to have a lot of echo compared to Corey's audio, and I solved almost all of that with this blanket and $10 Walmart clothes rack that I can roll wherever I want. I'm also starting to put up these standard acoustic foam panels on the wall to deaden the echo just a tiny bit more, and then I think I'll finally be happy with it. Surprising no one, I use a teleprompter too. I'm a terrible at... Surprising no one, I use a teleprompter too. I'm a terrible ad-libber and it just makes producing the show a lot more comfortable for me. I mean, I'm reading it right now and if you can tell, well, I'm just trying my best. It's a really cheap teleprompter. No, really, that's what it's called, though it's actually not as cheap as the name implies. So that pretty much sums up the studio room. Got some assorted stuff we're borrowing from people for future episodes right here, but never mind all that. I've got one more space I want to show you. Let's head back out here. You saw my old HD CRT and RGB 104, which I honestly hadn't used much since about 2010. And in more recent years, I realized it wasn't quite as awesome for retro gaming as I once thought. I finally convinced myself to part with it shortly after RGB 104, and I'm really excited about the proper retro setup I've put in its place. This is the TV cabinet that I used throughout my teenage years. It's nothing special, cheap and pretty worn down, but dang it, I just have a lot of nostalgia for it. 
They've been at my parents' house for years, and I'm honestly surprised I was able to get them to hold on to it for as long as they did. The TV is from 2005, a later standard definition CRT from Toshiba. I used it my senior year in college, and I just got lucky choosing this one really because these Toshibas are generally considered to be some of the best consumer grade CRTs to have. I've got a variety of spare consoles set up here, older models that are redundant with my main setup downstairs, it's just stuff people have given me over the years. I'm not necessarily using the best connections with everything here, heck the NES and N64 are even connected with RF. And really I think that's fine for this, I might upgrade some of it over time, who knows, but really I just want to have this set as another space to shoot in. So, you can expect to see more of it in the future. Well, that pretty much covers it. Our gaming setups support the show, and the show drives what we do with our setups. It's kind of like a mini ecosystem full of awesome stuff that lets us do what we love. We hope you enjoyed this look behind the scenes, and thank you for watching My Life in Gaming. <laughs>